Hey, welcome back to the Intercooler podcast with me, Dan Prosser, Andrew Frankel sitting opposite me in our Wizzy New Studio, um, and we're joined by a guest, uh, a very special guest, actually. Very special guest. One of our newest writers, Dr. Ulrich Eichhorn. Um, there he is, waving on the screen. Um, Uli, I, I'm, this is the, the point in the podcast where I have to embarrass you by saying that yours has been one of the great modern automotive engineering careers. You've you worked on there's the lot, there's there's a lot more of those. Well, okay. You you worked on the original Ford Focus chassis, which is clearly a big deal. Um, you were a board member at Bentley, responsible for engineering. Um, around the time the company went through its tremendous renaissance, and following the Dieselgate scandal, you became the Volkswagen Group's chief technical officer. Um, Andrew Uli is clearly a heavy hitter in automotive engineering. Can you just Tell us how you guys got to know one another. Uh, I think we probably first met um, at Bentley. Um, and, yeah, we met up a lot over the years. Um, and, I, I, well, two things. I've, I've always had, obviously, the utmost respect for, for Uli and, and, and his career. But, actually, we, we just had a lot of fun together. Um, and we are, you know, the, the, there are car guys and there are car guys. And, and, and Uli is as car a guy as you'll ever come across. Mm. Um, you know, a petrol head to his to his bones and you know just just someone who and also as a journalist so this is terrible sitting here, talking to you about Uli when he's sitting on the screen but uh, Uli just communicates in a way that journalists understand um and he was always a really good guy to talk to because there was never any bullshit um he'd be completely straightforward with you um and and you understood um, what he was trying to say. So, um, yeah, great, Uli, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Um, I hope you're keeping well. Um, and I'm really, I'm just really looking forward to talking yeah. to you about um, about your life and times, really. So, Uli, let's go back to the beginning. Why cars? How did that happen for you? Why did you become so interested in cars? Well, on, on the one hand, you may say it was always in the family. Um, when I was a little kid, uh, my uh, dad just uh, and grandfather uh, owned a petrol station and um, were, when I was three, were just uh, taking over a, a Fiat dealership or uh, added a Fiat dealership. Um, and um, there is a, 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 a picture in the family album that shows three-year-old Uli in, sh uh, in short uh, trousers. Uh, helping uh, build the workshop with, uh, <laughs> with, 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 with a little garden hose, putting water into the concrete. Uh, I don't know how helpful it actually was, but uh, it was uh, great fun when I look at the picture. I cannot remember that. Uh, and from age uh, 14 on, um, not quite legal at the time, but uh, in a family business, uh, you always do what, you, what needs doing. So I worked at the petrol station and I decided then that I'm not going to uh, fill up, wash, change oil, etc., on cars for my life, but I'm going to create cars. And uh, well, pretty much that's what that, that was that, that's what brought me there. Great. Thankfully, my brother took over uh, the car dealerships because it's grown from the pet, one petrol station to several car dealerships. And uh, well, that, that, that too was great fun. So where do we begin with your actual career, Uli? I mean, you studied at Darmstadt, and then where, where was your first job in the industry? First job in the industry, well, it was half industry. When, uh, when I had finished um, my studies, I uh, was offered um, a, a research assistance job at the university, uh, which was an international research project, Prometheus, largely forgotten now. Uh, but it was the first time that uh, pretty much all of the European car industry, car makers, suppliers, and some others, uh, researched together um, and um, across uh, across uh, boundaries. So it was Italy, Italy uh, France, uh, UK a lot. W worked with Lucas and Jaguar, which was a great pleasure. Um, and um, we worked on tire road friction. I, uh, I, I was cheeky enough to put a, um, a, a slide from that in uh, the, yeah. my contribution on the ice speed record, which explains some things why driving on ice is not really that um, much recommended. <laughs> um, so that was that, that that was four years, and um, I uh, my, my sponsor was Porsche, uh, so that, well, that was pretty good, and Volkswagen, um, and. Um, 
Then when I finished that, uh, there was a crisis in uh, the auto industry in general. Uh, that was in 1993. Um, so um, I... Um, I sent out a handful of um, of CVs and uh, applications, and I was uh, almost accepted by BMW, um, which uh, after some interviews with Paul Roche, uh, and that would have been with their uh, DTM racing department. Mm, wow! Uh, but they decided to pull out of DTM racing, um, and um, I also had two offer two two separate uh, job offers from uh, Ford in uh, Germany uh, in the. Uh, John Andrews uh, Development Center in um, in Cologne, and um, because I was v very impressed with Richard Perry Jones, uh, I joined Ford. Now my uh, my parents and some of the customers, because I've been selling cars and repairing cars in our dealership, said, "Well, Uli, you cannot really do that. You cannot go to Ford. You're a BMW guy. Uh, Ford is such a step down." Uh, but um, that was not the point, and uh, it turned out, it turned out great because I had so much um, uh, leeway given by uh, Richard uh, to influence the way things uh, were uh, happening and developing. Early, can, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? Can could you just give us you know, a minute on um, Richard Parry Jones, um, who I think probably most people listening to this will know who we're talking about, but he was this. Uh, he was this incredible engineer who was, you know, you will remember as well as I, just the sort of state that Ford was in at the beginning of the 1990s. Um, and the role he then played, in which you helped him play, in really transforming that that company and its products into, you know, absolutely, you know, well-beating propositions. Yep. Um well, as you said about me uh, previously, uh, he, he he was a car guy through and through. A lot of people know that he was a, co a rally co-driver with Brendan Adams uh, uh, Evans uh, when he was uh, when he was young. He was a hellishly fast driver himself. Um, and, hellishly. <laughs> And I can uh, I, on, on on all any position in the car I've driven with him. Me, sometimes me in the driving seat that felt better, but uh, with him I always felt okay. I'm always feeling okay, how, regardless how uh, fast someone drives, when I know and feel uh, that he knows what he's doing. Uh, as I said before, I was also selling cars, and sometimes you get in the passenger seat uh, when uh, a possible client makes a, a, a test drive, and that scared me a lot more than Richard's uh, hmm. um, most spirited driving. Um, he was put in charge of engineering on, in Ford of Europe, in fact, that was not his real title at the time. Uh, after the disaster um, of um, the uh, of the Escort um, at, at the time in the early 90s, yeah. uh, because Ford realized that uh, they had gotten the car that the Ford system wanted. No, no risk, uh, cheap to make, comparatively cheap, uh, cheaply engineered, um, and uh, well, customers won't notice that it's not quite as good as some of the others and uh, what do customers know in the first place. So uh, that caused a serious crisis uh, for Ford of Europe because uh, they were selling a lot of Fiestas, but you don't make much money on Fiestas. Uh, they had mm. just introduced, uh, ju were just in the way of introducing uh, the uh, the Mondeo in '93, but were selling Sierras. That was uh, the money maker, but that was on his last leg, so they were not selling enough of them, and they were not making any money on them. So uh, the only one that really made money for Ford, besides the Transit, uh, was the Escort, and they launched a new Escort, which was a disaster. Um, and uh, it, it takes some doing to lose comparison tests, group tests, uh, when the car is brand new against competition that is about <laughs> to be uh, renewed in the next two years, uh, which the Escort did, especially in one uh, landmark auto car. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And, Escort uh, beats its rivals and loses. <laughs> yeah, I remember exactly. it well. And it, it was... It, that, of course, causes more of a stir in the UK than in Germany, where we always uh, thought Fords are rubbish in the first place. So uh, <laughs> you don't need to uh, read the test because they'll lose against a, 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 a Golf or um, even against an Opel Kadett, um, a, a, a German version of the Vauxhall. Um, so uh, that, that was not such a stir, but still, uh, if the car doesn't sell, the car doesn't sell. So Ford was a bit desperate and they realized that they don't know what to do about it. Uh, so uh, that's the, exactly the sort of situation where you get somebody like Richard Perry Jones. Under normal conditions, they probably would not have promoted him that fast and would not have given him all the powers that he had. Mm. Because for a while, 
he was wielding powers that were almost, not quite, almost as absolute as uh, in part of Europe as uh, PX uh, powers uh, a, a little bit later uh, were at Volkswagen. So uh, Richard decided that um, the uh, the other com the competition from the Germans and the French in particular uh, will ca they cannot trump them on um, on powertrains, especially not on diesels, uh, not on craftsmanship, um, um, not uh, or build quality, uh, and not on a few other things, especially brand image. So he very clearly decided uh, to, uh, put, uh, to 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 trump them on uh, refinement. Uh, NVH as it's called uh, here on package, have a very different styling and vehicle dynamics, um, right steering handling, which is close to his heart anyway. And um, he put um, young, uh, promising managers in charge uh, of these things, and uh, the right and handling vehicle dynamics part uh, fell to me. So, now, so, so is it, so I mean, those of us who are around at the time, sadly, Dan was, you were still wearing quite short trousers mm -hmm. at the time, but I was certainly around. And when that focus came out, 97, 98, one of the two. Yeah, 97. Yeah. Um, and even though we'd already seen how big an improvement over the Sierra the Mondeo had been, to get out of that dreadful escort and into that focus and see Ford making essentially the worst car in the class to becoming instantly and by a mile, certainly for anybody who cared anything about driving, the best. I mean, that was an extraordinary moment. And it was, I mean, we all sort of talk about the rear suspension on that car and, you know, the, the control blade rear suspension and everything. But I mean, again, without wishing to sort of, you know, blow your trumpet too much. I mean, a lot of that was, was you, wasn't it? And your team. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the things you mentioned all were, but uh, individually that would, or if it had been only these, that would not have been enough, uh, sufficient. So uh, it needed to uh, clearly distance itself from, uh, the, uh, from the escort. And although in the mid-cycle facelift, a few of the, um, of the um, weaknesses of the escort had been uh, ameliorated a little bit, although not uh, completely taken out, um, uh, yeah, that was the that, that was the thing that everybody notices. Uh, but the, the 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 step change that it had in refinement, of course, also contributes to the uh, feeling of their, of very good ride and of the car being together. The body shell was much stiffer, which helped all of us. Uh, the package was a lot better, and um, it was an, uh, for the time uh, an extraordinarily tall car in uh, in its class and uh, the C class. And of course, uh, Claude Lobo's um, styling, with, uh, introducing the new edge in its full uh, glory, uh, that was um, also a point of distancing itself from uh, the escort, uh, as was the, as was the name. Uh, so, sure. um, if we, if we look into my contribution, I was um, at the same time at this uh, in, in this stage, I was uh, Europe's vehicle dynamic manager. I was also the global head of vehicle dynamics. Uh, bizarrely, I had more people in the US than uh, in uh, than in Europe. I had some in the UK, some in Germany, some in Belgium on the uh, on, on the test track. Lommel. And uh, I also had two in Australia, which who I only visited two times in a, in a few years. Uh, but uh, that, that, that was a fantastic time. And in the focus, we could bring all the things together that we had learned on, uh, on, on uh, the other cars. And that um, also formed a, an identity, a vehicle dynamics identity or DNA uh, that we also quantified. Um, and it was based on, a cu on customer research or driving with real customers rather than uh, relying on uh, quality data or what the engineers believed, which man in many cases turned out to be wrong, uh, or even what you journalists write, because that's not specific enough for uh, developing a car. Um, oh, hold uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, no, early... I, I appreciate you just don't you okay. just don't have enough, don't that, that just don't have enough words for that. Oh, that's but, true. Uh, <laughs> but what, what what you get when you create a car like that? It's not just a car which exists in isolation and you know comes and goes. You created a whole dynamic template, a a sort of something for Ford to base an identity and on. a reputation, yeah, and a reputation and something yeah. for. You know, which I think to an extent is probably still there in the company today, this reputation for building cars that were just 
that bit better to drive, when the focus is case, wildly better to drive, um, that has stayed with. So, I mean, they're kind of still dining out on your efforts, whatever it is, 27, 28 years later on. Yeah. And um, that, that, that is one of the things that I'm really proud of, that uh, here, as in uh, most other places where I've been, uh, it was not just uh, Uli comes and fixes things and then goes away and things fall fall to pieces. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of managers um, are proud about that because that gives them uh, <laughs> uh, the feeling of uh, it being their own greatness. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's not the right approach. You want to leave something yeah. uh, that endures. You need to train some people. You need to train your success, some, some possible successors, not just one. And um, in the uh, in in all cases, we also. Uh, clearly defined what we want, put it down in writing, in charts, in measurements, etc., so that it's not uh, also not uh, depending on uh, the on the feeling or taste and ability to to sense things. Uh, that was very important. And you, we had also had a training course for those. Uh, but uh, to, to leave something, big word to call it a legacy, but to change the, uh, the, the company's DNA a little mm. bit, uh, that, that, that was really one of the most satisfying things. That, yeah, that's, I, a, that's a real achievement, isn't it? To, to be able to step away and for that group, that organization to continue doing excellent work. Um, so I, I just wonder if during the development of the original Focus, if there was a day when you remember perhaps being at Lommel, the Ford's Proving Ground in Belgium, isn't it? When yeah. you drove a prototype and you thought, wow, we've got this. Or did it just actually happen over time, over a couple of years? Um, there were a few such moments and there were a few, a few moments in between where I thought, thought uh, shoot, this stuff just doesn't work. <laughs> um, we, 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 uh, we um, with the help of the plant manager, stole some rear suspensions from uh, the Mondeo estate, which is similar in concept, but different in execution. Um, uh, uh, put them under a uh, folk uh, under an escort estate, uh, so, uh, and uh, which was carrying the new, completely redeveloped uh, front strut suspension of the Focus, uh, as compared with the uh, less well designed escort uh, front suspension, and put everything else in there, including some stiffeners in the body. Uh, so uh, we basically had a mule for uh, the uh, for for the Focus. Uh, we worked together a lot with, uh, with with Lotus and with a few others. Um, I remember the contribution from of, from uh, John Miles. Um, wow. wow, there you um, go. And uh, he was he was teaching us some things. Uh, Jackie Stewart, of course. But yeah. We only have yeah. Jackie every uh, few months or every few weeks if you wanted. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, there, there was one drive day with uh, with this car. Well, I thought, okay, this is the, 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 this will this will this is coming together. Of course, none of the components uh, at this point were as they should be, and as they later were. But the system behavior was was correct. Okay, mm. and the car of course was was noisy, uh, rattled like a bucket full of screws, yeah. um, and uh, open uh, all around. And uh, at, uh, at at some time, the door locks didn't work, so we had to break in through the rear window. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we clearly got the feeling, okay, this is, we're on the right track here. This combination works. Gosh, I think um, I think that's the first time I've heard um, that Lotus uh, and John Miles were involved in, in any, to any extent in the development of that car. Uh, we communicated that at the time, but yeah. uh, uh, I've probably uh, forgotten uh, it. <laughs> it. It all it all get, it all gets forgotten. Andrew, just for people who don't know, can you explain who John Miles is? Yeah, John Miles was. Um, he was really great. He was, I mean, he most famous for being Jochen Rint's teammate at Team Lotus in the late 1960s and 1970. Um, yes, yeah, so a Formula One driver, but also, I mean, I think he would probably most want to be remembered as um, one of the people who made Lotus feel the way that where they are. He was a fantastic chassis developer. He was a great thinker. Mm. Um, he can be fantastically bad tempered, particularly around motoring journalists. Um, <laughs> he fancied himself. In fact, he had a column in Autocar for years called Miles Behind yeah. the Wheel. Yeah. Um, and he, he actually, we used to go up there. Uh, we went up to Hethel and we'd sit in a room for a couple of days with John and then we'd go out and we'd drive with him. And he, he's one of the people who kind of taught me how to you know, not drive a car, but how to assess a mm. car properly and to kind of understand what a car was trying to say to me. So, you know, a really, really great guy. 
Wow. Um, but yeah, but back to Uli. I'm just aware that we need this. There's so much <laughs> yes. we've got to get through, and uh, we could spend the entire thing talking about the focus. But I think we we probably need to move on. Well, a bit, let's, don't we? that's right. Let's let's move it on. But final thoughts on the focus. If if you've had a great big victory like that, if you have that victory under your belt, are you now a man in demand in automotive engineering circles? Mm. Yeah. So your career I mean, is off and away now. Yeah, yeah. I was I I I, I got a number of job offers uh, based on that. Uh, and I turned them down, uh, all, all of them I turned down, um, uh, to the point where people started hire other car companies started hiring uh, the people around me, mm. uh, like uh, Michael Fletzker, Peter Schäfer, Stefan Gies, uh, and, 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 and a few more. Um, and uh, when Piech asked me for the third time, I remember a, a Japanese corporate saying of a um, if the boss of a big company asks you three times, uh, you need to go. Uh, <laughs> so this is Dr. Ferdinand Pieck. I couldn't turn down. Yeah. Dr. Ferdinand Pieck, who we recorded a podcast all about him yes. a couple of months ago, Andrew. So probably... Yes, you, you were right on many things, but uh, not, 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 not on all that we can talk about. That in <laughs> okay. Maybe that's another and podcast. Then, he then went on to be my boss for nearly 20 years. Yeah. Goodness me! Um, so briefly, did, sorry, sorry, um, just br briefly on Pitt, did you like him? I mean, I, I'm, I'm clearly we all admired the man and his extraordinary achievements, everything from the Porsche 917, you know, onwards. But did you actually, person to person, did you like him? Um, yes, I, yes, I liked him, um, and um, not just for being for for being the great boss, but he was a, he he was a person of of great depth and. Uh, uh, in deep in his heart, he was actually a shy person, yeah. uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why he put up this uh, impenetrable facade, yeah. uh, which uh, in private you often uh, let down this this guard. So uh, he uh, he always had perfectly prepared texts uh, to read uh, when he was when he gave a speech, uh, and he had uh, a staff to write that for him, of course. Mm. Uh, and that always felt very stiff. Uh, when uh, we had um, a, an internal round, so the first the first Christmas, uh, engineering Christmas party, uh, he, he gave an impromptu speech, which was, which was great and lively and everything. Uh, so, but, the, 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 uh, so behind that, as you say, impenetrable facade, there was a sense of humour in there somewhere. Oh yes. Oh, I'm yeah, so pleased. Yeah. I'm so yeah, pleased. He had, he had he had this uh, this small smile um, and. Uh, when, 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 whenever, whenever that came up, you know, he, he, was, he was up to some mischief. Um, and um, he, he, had, he had some great ideas. And um, sometimes these ideas were just uh, thrown in with one sentence. And, uh, but, but, but you always knew you have a task now and uh, failure is not an option. And uh, you just deliver that. Yeah. Don't have to. You don't have to explain how or why or or, or, or what. You just you, you just go and do it, and uh, if it works, great. Because there were always real challenges. It's never easy stuff, at least not to me. Uh, so uh, it um, and um, when you have had tried with good faith effort everything, and it didn't work, and I had a few of those. Um, then uh, you, could you could come to and say, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Piech, this didn't work. Uh, and then he gave you some suggestions how it might work, which of course you had exhausted before already. Uh, and then after two weeks, you came back and says, it still, it, it, it still doesn't work. But he was clearly working on the principle, if you want the maximum possible, you have to demand the impossible. And um, wow. he got that. Yeah. Do, do you think, and, I, and you know, we need to keep this brief because it's not really what the podcast is about and we're really rather leaping forward, but just briefly on Dieselgate, there was a culture, wasn't there, which meant that engineers weren't prepared to say, we can't do this within the bounds of, you know, of, of legality or whatever. And it was it was that which made them do what they did because within Volkswagen there was this culture of you can't fail, and so rather than fail, they tried to kind of find a way around. Is is, is that a fair thing to say? Some people may have thought that way, um, but um, if you had seriously with full effort tried and couldn't make it work, just like I uh, like I explained, yeah. Um, uh, that 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 was not as good as if it had worked, 
but it had no real negative consequences. Okay. So uh, mm. it was more like uh, it was more uh, the, the, these these people um, uh, didn't have enough courage uh, to go to their boss, or the boss didn't have the courage to relay it. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, had they said at the time that uh, without this and that, that doesn't work, and uh, their boss had taken it to their bo- to, to his boss and so and and, and so on, uh, that would have really helped the company. That would have been okay, and everything would have been okay. But okay, it's fine. Better, than, better than later getting fired or, or, or imprisoned. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, just a bit. Don't look over your shoulder, Uli, because it's not really there. But for people watching, um, there is a very dramatic-looking supercar behind you. Um, Stunning, isn't it? Vo- Volkswagen W12, is that right? Was it yeah. Nardo at this point, or was that yeah. an old yeah. name? So a, a concept um, Volkswagen supercar that you were heavily involved in. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that's one of the highlights um, of your time at Volkswagen, that first stint. Yeah. My my the, my the my first three years at Volkswagen uh, was were, were in research. So I was heading yeah. Volkswagen research. Uh, people always talk about research and development as if it was one thing, uh, but uh, Volkswagen Group's overall development is at that time was around uh, thirty thousand engineers, and uh, research was five hundred. So we were about one wow. percent of, uh, of the lot. Although in research and development, it always comes first. But this and, was uh, this was at a time I think I'm right in saying when the Volkswagen Group were investing in well both research and developing development, unlike any other car company yeah. in the world. I can remember doing I I can't remember what the number was, but it was it was over a hundred billion, and it was like more than the GDP of quite a lot of countries. The Volkswagen was investing purely in research and development. Well, I shouldn't say the real number. Uh, it wasn't 100 billion. Uh, it maybe over a, over a five-year cycle or something like that. But uh, yes, we were we were uh, spending a percentage on research and development, percentage of revenue that was comparable with uh, Mercedes's. Uh, uh, but of course, we had a lot. We were selling a lot more cars already. Sure. Uh, so um, that uh, and that was all PX investment into the future. And um, the, uh, the the car you see behind me, which is the actual record car, mm. um, so I'm not in, I'm not sitting in my garage. <laughs> uh, squirrels that away, although squirreling is uh, closely connected with my family name. Um, but uh, this is in the in, in the Zeithaus Museum in uh, in, in Wolfsburg uh, currently. Um, but this was used as a vehicle in the true sense of the word uh, to present a W12 engine. And the W12 engine uh, was uh, to become the mainstay of uh, Volkswagen Group's um, uh, uh, luxury cars, uh, the D segment, as we call it in uh, in Wolfsburg, and it would be an F segment in uh, worldwide uh, parlance. Uh, so, uh, and that was seen as a somewhat fragile engine. Uh, when you look at it, it's uh, very compact and it has bits that are uh, smaller than uh, most 12-cylinder engines. And there were some rumors. Ah, oh, this is never going to last. And how, how can how can an engine that is uh, physically um, a, a, a third smaller than any other twelve cylinder and smaller than all uh, ten cylinders in the world and smaller than than many V8s? How can that package six uh, liters of displacement and uh, six hundred or more horsepower? Uh, so we decided to um, after had, we had showed that in uh, in. In some on, uh, in some on, on some car shows in uh, a nicely painted uh, car, not in the matte black as this one is, we decided to go uh, with on a rec- with a record for it for the and it was the to be the 24 hour world speed record uh, officially sanctioned by the FAA, uh, FIA, and that's what this car behind me did. And was, uh, and was that a, was that a naturally aspirated engine then rather than the twin the turbo it became version, um, uh, with trumpets and everything, developing 600 horsepower already at the time. Um, and um, we slightly detuned it for the uh, record effort because in, uh, at Nardo it gets pretty hot uh, during the day. And uh, 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 that, that, that's a story that I wrote on for, yeah. for the intercooler on that one. And it's too, that you, you classified that as a long read because I never get away with that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I don't want to go into my, many of the details now, but. Um, the previous record was held by uh, Ferrari at 285, and uh, we ultimately kilometers per hour. That is so uh, about 175 or so um, miles per hour, 
and uh, we bettered it to 201, 202 uh, miles per hour, 325 uh, kilometers per hour. Over, over um, what distance? 24 what? hours. 24 hours, was it? 20, yeah. right, okay. 20, 20, 24 hour world speed record. Oh, wow. And, we, and of course, we, we, we did the, the very short records you, don't, you can't do with a car that you build for the long run. No. So uh, the, the, fly, the, the flying kilometer or something you cannot do with, with, with a car that is intended to run 24 hours. But everything, but everything I think, from one hour onwards, uh, so six hours, 1,000 kilometers, 1,000 miles, uh, 5,000 mm. kilometers, we uh, fall within that because we did more than 5,000 kilometers in 24 hours. And because we also wanted the 5,000 miles, we kept running on after 24 hours, uh, and the car was running nicely. Uh, so uh, that's the same. So in total, we collected uh, 12 records, six of them absolute world speed records. No one on land has ever gone faster. And the others, uh, the other six still international class records. And, and do they stand? Uh, yes, yes. That was that was in two in, in 2001. Um, and uh, so and they, they stand to this day. Yes. Wow. 5,000 miles at 200 miles 5, an hour. 5,000 miles. And that, and that, that, well, you presume that, that, I mean, that's, that's clearly inclusive of stops and you know, oh, yeah. driver changes yeah, but, and filling it with fuel. Did you have to yeah. service the car at all? Did you change the oil or anything, or did you just let it get on with it? We changed the oil in the middle of the night yeah. uh, just because it's good practice, and uh, we were uh, well ahead of everything else. Um, uh, we, we, we did several trial runs, and we learned a lot from that. Um, and um, in the end, we didn't have to do any repairs in, in, the, in the final run that gave us the 200 miles per hour. Um, we only stopped for changing tires and drivers and refueling. Um, if you look closely at the car behind me, you see that its ride height is a bit uh, yeah. is a bit higher than the designers. Jujaro it was uh, actually designed uh, by Jujaro Junior, not mm. by Giorgetto. Um, and but that's because it has a two, it has a tank with a capacity of 240 liters. Um, so that's 180 kilo to put in the car, uh, plus uh, a, a normal sized driver. So and the whole car only weighs 1,200 kilo. Uh, so uh, when it's fully tanked and has a and has a chap in there, then it's uh, it's looking better. Uh, so we only we on, on in the fi in the final run uh, it was running like a clockwork. We only had to do uh, as I said fuel stops, uh, driver changes, tire changes. Wow. So can you? draw a line from that car to the Bugatti Veyron ultimately was there some sort of shared DNA at all uh, well in, 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 in many ways yes they're, they're both mid-engine also the configuration is different yeah. this has the gearbox behind the engine whereas the Bugatti has it in front uh, this one is rear-wheel drive but it's a V uh, it's not a V engine but a W engine mm. W12 in this case W16 which in concept is closely related although they share no parts. Um, and um, uh, we developed uh, in the research and development laboratories uh, at the same time, actually in, uh, in neighboring booths, uh, they, uh, we did the Nardo, the, uh, the, the Veyron, which was not called Veyron at the time, just had a project code, uh, and the one liter uh, car. Uh, so we, <laughs> we spanned the whole thing from the world's fastest yeah. car, the most powerful car, and the mo world's most frugal car. Uh, all uh, under the same roof, the same workshop. Wow! I, I have to ask you, just with Dan, we did a podcast very recently about mad engine configurations, um, and I brought up the W18. Were you yeah. in any way involved in that? Was that ever a serious proposition, or was it? I mean, I know that the the, the engine was built and it ran, didn't it? But was was yeah. that ever a, a, a serious production possibility? Um, that was tossed around about and if the bugatti um if, if the initial bugatti after uh, under volkswagen ownership uh, had turned out to be a different car that might have gone in production um, because when you're only building 100 cars or less a year you can uh, all go by race car engineering you can go with sand casts and etc mm. so you're free from uh, using anything that uh, is used somewhere else whereas when you're in the thousands per uh, per year uh, you have to look for economies of scale. Sure. And um, the, so when I said earlier that the uh, that the, uh, the the W16 and the uh, W12 are closely related, they are because they have one they, they have one crankshaft and they have uh, two banks, one of eight uh, each eight or each six cylinders. Yeah. But with different basic dimensions, bore spacing, etc. Uh, on uh, and um, the uh, the. The, the W18 before was three rows 
of uh, six um, cylinders yeah. uh, absolutely in line. A true W, really? Uh, no, an arrow. An arrow, an arrow. yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, right, write the letter W on the paper in front of you and you'll see that... Uh, yeah. It's closer. That, 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 ...that this is more like uh, the engine that we are using, uh, whereas the arrow <laughs> configuration... And you mentioned in the, in, uh, in in the outbound podcast from uh, just just the other day the X twenty four, yeah, uh, from Rolls Royce. That's the same. That's the same thinking. Okay. So you, you just have one crankshaft, and you and you keep adding rows of six cylinders to that. Uh, and uh, we discussed that. We discussed when well if we have that we have that W eighteen running, which was not W but arrow, um, and you could have added one. Or two more rows because the, 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 these were at sixty degree angle, uh, so we, you, could, you could have added more, more just added, keep adding more rows to it. <laughs> so, you, so you talked about an X twenty four. That that, that not, not 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 an X. It would, would be a, a wide angle W because it wouldn't X. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that that of course creates um, packages that make it completely infeasible for a car. Uh, as aero engines, you can probably do that. Yeah. Just like uh, just like the World War II, um, uh, the, the, the two leading engines, one was up an upright uh, V12, the Merlin, and the other an upside down with a crankshaft on top. The Daimler. Uh, the, the, the DB601. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's uh, that, that's um, weird engine configurations. Yeah. But we decided against uh, that, and the, there's a very simple reason for uh, for, for that. The very reason why uh, we uh, why we created the uh, VR6 in the first place, which was before my time, uh, was that um, you're always restricted by length. And in, at, at that time, uh, we, uh, my colleagues were looking for how to put six cylinders under uh, the uh, hood of a um, uh, of a Golf, and. Um, that, that that just makes it too long if you want proper dis, uh, uh, displacement. Uh, and uh, with the staggered setup uh, that uh, the, the VR6 uh, uses, which is basically um, just like like a straight six, but every other cylinder is offset. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, that gave us in, within the length of a two liter four cylinder gave us the possibility for uh, three or later more uh, liters of six cylinder. So that was a huge improvement, and it opened up putting six cylinders in Golf or Passat-based um, cars, later called M uh, United as the MQB. Um, and um, well, once you have a six-cylinder that is as short as uh, uh, as a four-cylinder, you might as well to put two of these together um, to have a twelve-cylinder that is as short as an eight-cylinder. It's and, clever, isn't and, it? Yeah, it's fantastic. And not, stuff. and not wider too, because you're running a smaller V angle. Yeah, um, it, it makes the hell, it makes the valve train very complicated. But we have complicated valve trains all over the place. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the other advantage that it has, it uh, you get conventional uh, intakes and exhaust systems. So you have the uh, the uh, we used ex, uh, intake on the uh, within the V and exhaust on the outside. You can turn that around. But we never did on the uh, on, on the uh, W or VR engines. So there's a there's a clear lineage from the VR6 yeah. um, and to the uh, to the W12. We also did uh, experimentally a VR8. Wow. That's one, one one row of staggered cylinders with eight, or a W8, which is two rows of um, of four cylinders. Staggered mm. again. Was that the the Passat engine? That's the Passat engine. Yeah. Um, um, and um, Arno Homburg, I think you who, you, who you've met, um, he uh, he he just bought one of these, and it's one of the smoothest running and smoothest yeah, revving engines that you can ever get. In spite of its flat crank, we needed to put in the flat crank to get the power. Uh, then, of course, you get vibration uh, and. and uh, then uh, we put in an elaborate uh, balance shaft uh, system to to kill the uh, to kill the vibration. So uh, it it revs up like a small six cylinder, uh, but of course has a lot more power. So it it seems to me, early after everything that you've done in your career at this point, so we're talking early two thousands, um, you probably could have gone anywhere to work. And you chose a small town in the northwest <laughs> of England. <laughs> what what brought you to Bentley? Well, 
uh, when I joined Volkswagen, uh, I uh, had never dreamed of that, uh, uh, that that I would be working on 16-cylinder, 12-cylinder, world yeah. record cars, etc. I thought otherwise. Uh, but um, it, 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 was, it was very simple. I wanted to create cars. I'd done all these uh, nice things that we talked about. Um, and, um, the, uh, and, and I always was a fan of powerful and uh, very high uh, uh, quality top end cars. And um, uh, we we we, owned, we had already owned Bentley a while. Uh, Uli Hackenberg and um, and Hans Rotenpiller had been there as chief engineers for a while. And um, Dan Pischetsrieder was the uh, the group CEO at the time. And he asked me when we were driving a car to, uh, a research car together um, if I, if, I, if I if I wanted to do that. And uh, I I didn't have to, to to think very much. I then drove home, uh, and uh, my wife uh, knows when I'm coming back uh, around lunchtime. Uh, there's a change coming. <laughs> <laughs> You're home as early, <laughs> we, as, we, as we had just moved from Essex to um, oh. uh, 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 to, to Wolfsburg uh, three years earlier. Uh, so she asked, "Well, where are we going?" And I said, "England." And she said, "Okay, when do I need to be packed?" Wow! <laughs> and that was that. Wow! Brilliant. Uh, and of Fantastic. course, there, there, there wasn't there was not a challenge uh, as big as this anywhere else in the group. Of course, um, in 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 that year, um, in two thousand and three, uh, Bentley sold around a thousand cars, still a few Rolls Royces amongst them, uh, and uh, we had a not fully developed but otherwise fantastic uh, uh, Continental GT. Um, and we had uh, we, we had uh, the factory uh, completely overhauled. We had the new the new engine and a world class engine building facility, etc. Uh, but it was clear that there's going to be a lot of work coming, and uh, we we had more than on the drawing boards. We already had models uh, of uh, one to one models of the uh, of, of the flying spur, um, and. Uh, so that was that, that was one of those things that you dream on uh, dream of at a petrol station when you're a, <laughs> when you're a young chap. So I, sorry, Oli, just to jump in a moment, I, I remember something that you wrote in one of your articles for us. You said that when you got to Crew, you um, you found that lots of the workforce called the place Royces. They referred to it as Royces because it was Rolls Royce, yeah. and so you had to you and your colleagues had to introduce this program, this initiative called becoming bentley yeah, yeah and how did people respond to that i mean d presumably once you start telling everyone about the wonderful heritage of bentley and everything that the mark stands for and has achieved do people come on board or was there some resistance well it took it it, it took some time but um they they there was on se worked on several levels. Uh, one was for the first time uh, they had uh, security of the future because uh, yeah. Volkswagen was investing a lot of money, much more money than uh, the previous owners of the company had invested in well probably the decades before yeah. that. Um, and they uh, it, and uh, uh, so, so so that that was the one thing they had security of the future. Uh, we, uh, they, they they got new got new leadership and we they, we all turned out to be rather approachable. Um, then there was the, the the daily level where suddenly they got good workwear, uh, the working conditions improved dramatically uh, because we cl cleaned out the factory, took out all the uh, all the old stuff uh, that uh, had run its course, uh, but retaining uh, what made the brand, mm. and uh, there were uh, we uh, and uh, they they suddenly could get Volkswagen, Skoda, Seat as uh, on uh, on a sort of company car pro uh, program. Um, and so on. So that 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 all helped, and uh, of course we, we get some seminal symbolic points. And um, one was that um, uh, one was that uh, the, our Le Mans program. Uh, yeah. We went to we went to Le Mans uh, three year program, and um, plan was to win in the third year. And as a bonus, we won one two in the in the third year. That was Brian Gush's project. Uh, also, um, we. Um, um, think, thinking back of the war, uh, the, uh, the, the, there had only been one uh, attack from German bombers on, uh, the, on, on, the, uh, on what's now the assembly hall. Um, and uh, as we found out later, uh, that was uh, uh, an uh, airplane that had lost its weight, wanted to bomb Liverpool. 
on the way back didn't find it. So uh, when the clouds opened, uh, they needed to get rid of their bombs, so they wow. dropped it on uh, what turned out to be Bentley and uh, damaged the substation, not much uh, damage done, uh, but because uh, uh, nobody was expecting an attack, um, one of the bombs went uh, into the end of the machine hall, which is now the end of the assembly hall, the final inspection. Uh, you, you know that, from uh, Andrew, and I think you, uh, Dan, you too. Uh, and uh, that killed 12 people. We found wow. we, we knew we knew that because we had on our homework on Bentley Heritage. Nobody on the site cared, but we put on a, 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 a big a big flag of remembrance uh, there with the names uh, of the associates uh, graved in, in brass and uh, with a big propeller there. Um, that was a little gesture, but it was uh, very, very much appreciated. Yeah. So, but Andrew, they, the VW group came in <clears throat> and did it right. That's a great example of it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, th there was, I think, um, and this is before Uli's time. I mean, there was obviously some resistance, but the fact is, is that, and I think perhaps the point that might have been missed is it wasn't the choice of, you know. Bentley under Volkswagen or Bentley as it was. Mm. It was the choice of Bentley under Volkswagen or, or no Bentley. Mm. Yeah. Um, that was the world you're looking at. And and if you think of the transformation yeah. that went through that place, um, you know, I was quite close to Bentley at the time because I, I was, you know, I was writing stuff about the Le Mans project and obviously um, MSB, the mid-sized Bentley, which became mm. the Continental GT, um, was the big news. Um and then suddenly, you, it, it was just like turning on a tap. There was so much potential. There was so much desire out there. People just wanted a Bentley, but they just hadn't been presented with one, which made sense until then. Mm. And then these guys came in and, you know, okay, so the Continental GT, I think, was largely done early by the time you got there. But the progression that car then took um, and everything yeah. else that came along um, – I hope we've got time to talk about the Mulsanne as well. Um, yeah. One yeah. of my absolute favourite cars ever. Um, yeah, so, I mean, clearly there was a, a there was a colossal adjustment to be made, first from Rolls-Royce to Bentley and then from Bentley um, to, you know, the Volkswagen group coming in. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's hard to... Any, I, can't, I can't imagine there's a person in the world who'd think that that wasn't, didn't turn out for the best. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned Mulsanne, so we are quickly running out of time, so... Go on, you two can now have your moment and talk about the Mulsanne. <laughs> well, just, just just talk to us about. Can you just talk to us about that engine? Um, you, I know, are. I, I think you're still the proud owner of an S2 Bentley, yep. um, with a six point three liter, I think, um, V8 engine in it. Six and a quarter. Six and okay, um, an engine that went into production, I think, in 1959. Correct. Um, and basically, which you you kept alive. Um, long after, I think almost anybody else would say, you've got this enormous engine powered by these, you know, with valves powered, operated by these strange things called push rods um, and, you know, revving to four and a half thousand or whatever. Um, how important, well, I mean, it must have been important to the Volkswagen Group because they put it back in the Arnage, didn't they? Um, yeah. it, you know, the engine had basically already been killed. Volkswagen brought it back, which again must have reassured an awful lot of people that Volkswagen was quite well motivated. Uh, and then you kept it alive, um, and more than anything else, you kept it alive in this wonderful machine, the sort of, to me, the ultimate modern Bentley, the, mm. the car which is everything I want a Bentley to be in terms of its the way that it drives, the way that it feels, the heft of the car, the quality of the car. Um, and that was that was all on your watch, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, my my time at Bentley was nine, a total of nine years, um, which um, is um, untypical uh, for um, uh, for board member for development. Uh, we normally only last about three or four years, um, and then something something happens. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, development of the um, I, so I had the pleasure that the development of a number of cars uh, fell completely into my tenure. So uh, it was uh, from from the concept to the uh, to, to the start of production, uh, and the Anarch was one of those. And um, uh, that that uh, that car was never uh, the Mulsanne, sorry, was one of those. Um, the uh, there never was planned to be a successor to the Anarch because it was seen as archaic and uh, it's, we're only making a thousand of these, etc. Uh, but uh, we we all. Especially Dr. Pefkin and me uh, had uh, had the feeling, conviction uh, that uh, you need to have a car in this class uh, to uh, give 
strange as it may sound, a halo to the mid-size Bentley, uh, mm. as, as it was called for a while, as you rightly said, for, uh, Andrew. Um, so um, we, st we, we started doing a, a pre-development program, um, retaining some of the base dimensions, but uh, well, as Colin Chapman would say, from here it designs itself. Uh, if you uh, if you keep the, the if you keep the, um, the the engine put in a new uh, eight speed gearbox from ZF and uh, and so on, then my guys surprised me by presenting me with a new rear suspension, uh, which they had done as a black project hidden from me uh, because <laughs> I'm not the only one who's doing black projects. Um, so uh, black meaning uh, unauthorized. Yeah. Uh, but so um, they um, so, so we 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 had the pieces to put together. And of course, in uh, in design styling, uh, they they're always working on uh, what to do next and uh, into which direction to take it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, uh, in in retrospect, a lot of people then saw the front end styling of uh, the uh, of of the um, of the Brooklands and the lines of the Brooklands as a pre as an intermediate step between the Anage and the uh, Mulsanne, which it was. Um, so uh, we, we we put all these pieces together, and um, then um, um, decided to make a, a, a proper project out of it. But by that by that time, uh, a lot of the, the, the stuff was there, um, and uh, we just put the Bentley pieces together. Can I? But uh, can I? Can I? Can I ask why, given that you had this state of the art modern twin turbo? W12 engine, which would have been far more powerful, far more efficient, um, and already in your cars. Why would you not then have used that? Why did you decide to, you know, go with the old soldier instead? Well, part of, part, part is that uh, this is one of the character engines, the defining engines uh, of Bentley over the long time, uh, and because of the. Uh, it, it's relaxed power delivery, uh, but relaxed but supreme power delivery. Um, we, we just thought this is uh, the one for the top uh, for the top Bentley. And um, when you put once you put the W12 uh, in, uh, you, uh, you you also should go to uh, the uh, to, to a four wheel drive. Other uh, otherwise you'd have uh, the same engine, rear wheel drive, etc. Uh, uh, and the car would lose everything against the flying spur. So we decided to uh, separate it in character a lot from the flying spur, uh, and uh, that was the logical conclusion. Uh, and uh, in its development, we always refer to the Flying Spur, before it got that name, of course, as the four-door GT. Yeah. And, mm. uh, and well, I mean, you've, you've driven that, 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 that a lot, uh, it's, uh, also at Nardo. Uh, and I mean, you can testify that uh, besides being a bit longer um, and um, slightly less nimble, although the GT is not that nimble to begin with, but um, uh, otherwise it drives just like the Continental GT. And we wanted a completely different experience here. That's mm. uh, that, that, that's why we perpetuated the W12. These, uh, these, the, the, the V8 versus the W12. Yeah. These takeovers by <clears throat> giant multinational corporations, for instance, the Volkswagen Group buying Bentley, it works when the buying party shows real respect for the the heritage mm. of the independent car maker, doesn't it? And that's yeah. clearly listening to you, you talk here early, the group really held Bentley's heritage in the highest regard. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, some of the, uh, some of the group board members uh, had uh, vintage Bentleys um, wow. in, in the, in the, uh, privately, etc. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we didn't, when you think about it, what sense does it make um, to, to, to buy uh, typically at a premium uh, a haloed um, uh, historic uh, yeah. company or brand, and, uh, and 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 then not use it. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I but mean, but, but also to you, Ali. I mean, W. O. Bentley himself. I mean, he was an engineer through and through, and the qualities that he admired most were just 
engineering stuff to the highest possible standards. And that must have really just, you know, even though, you know, he was doing that a hundred and more years ago, that must have must really resonated with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I always had a picture uh, of him in my office uh, to look over, looking over my shoulder. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he, um, and that was that, that that was true inspiration. I mean, he never worked that crew. Uh, his, his years at Bentley were the critical good years, much before that. Uh, but um, still, um, it's the it's the spirit of meticulous engineering, creating the best solutions, go, starting uh, from first principles, really understanding uh, the chain of cause and effect, and then uh, getting uh, the result and effect uh, that, that that you want. That's the mark of the of a, of a great engineer. Uh, and really going to the uh, the root cause and to the bottom of things uh, rather than uh, letting yourself get fobbed off with uh, superficial uh, mm. pseudo explanations. And uh, that was what was behind uh, his uh, engineering of his two rotary engines and of his uh, for the airplanes in World, in, uh, in World War One. Uh, and that uh, that's also behind uh, his uh, his car engines. Uh, and uh, uh, when you drive them. Uh, and I've driven his his own eight, eight liter that Rolls Royce took away from him when they took over the company. <laughs> I've driven that. I've, I've driven that. And after a kilometer or so driving, uh, you go, okay, I could be driving that for a thousand miles now and wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't uh, mind that. Yeah. And uh, and that feeling we also kept alive and we moved that on and on. And you find some of that uh, even in the Mulsanne. Ah oh, well. There really is only so much ground you can cover in an hour or so. Yeah. But Uli, it's been fascinating. It really has. Thank you so much for coming on, um, sharing your your thoughts and your memories. Um, yeah, you, you can come back. Yes. It's, it's been great. <laughs> We'd love to do it again, Uli. Um, to everyone watching and listening, um, well, hopefully you enjoyed that one. I thought it was a good episode. Uh, so please remember to just subscribe or follow. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. If you're listening to it as a podcast, just hit the little follow button or the subscribe button. Um, to you, Ali, thank you so much for coming on, and hopefully we can do it again at some at some point. Well, thanks. It was a pleasure. I always like to, I always like to talk about cars, as you have noticed. Oh, good. <laughs> so do we. Thanks, so Ali. Thanks, Ali. All Bye. the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cheers. Dan. Thanks, Andrew. Bye.